Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Faith Culture Kiss Studio for Acting. My name is Michelle Markwart DeVoe, and we are here today with a very good friend of mine who I've actually known her, gosh, a lot of years, probably 10 years, no, eight years. And we actually met in Spokane, Washington, even though we lived in the same city for a very long time. This is the fabulous Rachel Michaelberg. And I have to show you, we are having her today because yesterday this voice teacher extraordinaire and author launched her book, Crash, How I Became a Reluctant Caregiver. And I wanted you to meet her. I wanted to share some space with her today as both. I'm sure she's been on tour. We're going to talk to her about this, her virtual tour. But, um, you know, very rarely do we get to, do authors get to show all of the aspects of themselves when they're in their book tour, right? They have to talk about the story and the book and all being an author and all of those things. But today we want to have Rachel is fully voice teacher. Rachel is fully author with us today and celebrate with her this enormous accomplishment writing her memoir. So I'm going to bring her in here. Hi, everyone. This is Rachel. Hi. We are so good to be here. <laughs> we are so glad you are here. And Rachel, I loved your book. And I would love, I want to do a couple things. So first of all, I know that at some point today we want you to read an excerpt. And I also want to ask you a bunch of questions about what it was like to write it. But first, what I would really love is for you to kind of give give the people listening today kind of this picture of where you were as a voice teacher, as a mom, when you decided I need to write a memoir. What was that like? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I never, I never really woke up one day and said, I want to be a writer. It just, um, I had a story. I mm -hmm. had a story that I, I felt compelled to tell. And um, for most of my life, I was a um, performer, singer, obviously, um, uh, opera, mostly musical theater, and a cantor. And um, shortly before this incident, which uh, compelled me to write this book, which was my first husband's um, severe brain injury in a, in a plane crash, um, I had been working as a cantor mm -hmm. in a synagogue mm -hmm. for many years and uh, also performing um, and had two little kids, but I hadn't, I'd done very little teaching, mm -hmm. um, but I decided that the cantor, it wasn't really my true calling, that I wasn't really a clergy person. Um, that's not how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. So I decided to leave that and focus on my teaching. Yeah. and performing, and even though I've had little kids. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, I actually had given notice at the synagogue before that, before the accident. But then when the accident happened, everything kind of, um, you know, changed and kind of had to accelerate it. Um, so um, I decided to really build up my studio because it would have, it gave me more, um, flexibility in my schedule and more control over my schedule. And since I was then a single parent with the two small children, it wasn't until about three or four years after the accident that I realized that I really had a story. Mm. Um, so I began and I just, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so I just started taking writing classes. Um, I drove over to Santa Cruz. I live in, I lived in San Jose and, and Santa Cruz is about a 45 minute drive without traffic. And there's always traffic. Always, um, always, always, always. Um, but I just started taking classes and in, in learning the craft of writing and I'd always been pretty good at it, but never done it seriously. So um, the classes just gave me the confidence and the skill to just start writing and not worry about whether or not it was actually going to become a book, but just to get the ideas down and just to understand how to build an arc and, um, you know, how to, how to create interesting characters. So there were, there were actually a lot of parallels with, with learning a song with, you know, when I was going to say, yeah, yeah sounds like okay. singing almost. 
Yeah, you have to figure out your motivation. You have to figure out the character's motivation. And, um, you know, um, but with the written word, it's it's a little different. It's a little bit different. Um, you have to create dialogue. You have to reimagine dialogue that you might have said in a particular situation. Um, and of course, nobody remembers exactly what you did, especially like five years ago. Right. At the time. Yeah. So, and I hadn't kept a journal actually during this whole time. So wow. it, it, yeah, that's, that's, it's kind of a roundabout way of answering mm -hmm. your question. Was it that's challenging? I, was that challenging to kind of start to dig up those memories and, and then ask yourself what, what is a true memory and what is the thing that I want to believe? Because this was like a painful and traumatic thing, right? Was that, what was that like? Yeah, the, um, I didn't have a lot of um, memories that I thought were false, but what I wanted to do was be honest about, about my feelings that yeah. the scenes were more of a, of a, of a setting. Like I would, the first scene I wrote was, um, I, I don't want to give away too much, but mm -hmm. my, the, the social worker that, that I was working with, um, gave me an option to not bring my husband home mm -hmm. from the hospital um, because I had been very ill myself and just wasn't in any kind of physical or mental shape, shape at that time to take care of him. And I remember the horror at that idea that, you know, I'm not going to take him home um, mm -hmm. and how it evolved. So, so the first scene I wrote was that scene with the social worker, with her telling me and giving me that option. Um, and then from then, I just kept writing the, the scenes, the pivotal, the moments. You know, our, our minds are like movies, right? We play these memories, things that are significant, we usually remember. So I just started writing those down. And then the harder part was actually connecting them together. Oh. Yeah, was the transitions. And, and, and I people have told me that, that my book is like um, in a series of vignettes. Yes. Um, I but thought, I don't... I, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I never thought of it that way. Um, but what I don't do is I don't say, you know, Monday we did this, and then Tuesday we did that, and then Thursday we did that, because a lot of it was just kind of boring and not and sort of the same thing. Like, I only talked about driving the, my kids to summer camp if something happened on that drive that for that furthered the narrative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, it it was an interesting process to try to figure out what to include and what not to include. Yeah. Well, I appreciated that about the book, actually, Rachel, was I appreciated that you didn't linger on things. Like the way you set it up, it was very clear that there was a monotony to this caregiving. And that while you're dealing with this undercurrent of caregiving, there's these, these like explosions of difficulty and trauma and what the fuck and you know like all of this and I I really appreciated that you you didn't I don't know if wallow is the right word but like you didn't spend too much time kind of beating into us the idea that it's hard to be a caregiver it's like you assumed our intelligence you assumed like of course you know that it's hard to be a caregiver and then you're like, but let me just tell you the extra reasons why it was hard in my situation. And I really appreciated that. So I have some questions for you. Uh, to write them Can down. I just say what you, think about yes. what you just said about, um, first of all, I didn't, that was a huge concern. I did not want to be a whiner. I didn't want to be a mm. fetcher, you know, I, you know, like, you know, poor me that I really didn't want to come across that way. So I made sure with my editor and my feedback groups, it's like, I would always say, does this sound whiny to you? And they would say no. And then the second thing I wanted to follow up on what you said about, um, that's a really important thing I think writers need to do is to not underestimate their reader's intelligence, to understand that a reader is going to get that from, you know, um, particularly if you kind of know who your audience is, they're gonna get, they're gonna get it. You don't have to hit them over the head with everything, you know? Um, so that was, that was an important quality yeah. I wanted to have in the writing. Well, it's like, don't overact, right? Yeah, there you 
<laughs> like, like there's a difference between clarifying and making a strong choice to tell a story, which is what you've done, and then kind of emoting just to emote. Right. There's so many parallels in, in this, in, in my opinion, I wanted to say at the time, this was a really, like when I read this question, I was like, (gasps) so I wanted to ask you at the time of the crash, your marriage was not going well, but you put the past aside to care for David did you think he would be able to resume a normal life like at beginning? Did you think there was going to be a transition there? Tell us about that. So I don't want to give too much away, but I actually never became his full-time caregiver. I was, that's what the book, that's what the story is about, is about my rejection of that role and the repercussions of that rejection. Mm -hmm. And yet I also was still responsible for him and and making all the choices about him. Um, And so, um, I'm sorry, can you remind me? (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, um, did you think he would be able to resume a normal life? So one of the scenes in the book, and this is not giving too much away, is um, that um, a doctor who actually wasn't his doctor, but sort of a a friend, a a person who was in the congregation that we were involved with, who happened to be a rehab doctor in brain injury, Mm. visited David just sort of coincidentally. And and then he had, he told me, and this is one of the scenes in the book, he he told me in the hallway of the corridor of the hospital outside David's room, he said, he's never going to, he's never going to work again. He's never going to be able to resume any kind of normal relationships that, mm-hmm. that you had before, but any of any sort, and that was the first time anyone had actually really said that. Like it's no, it, he's never going to be. He's never going to be what you knew, mm-hmm. and um, so that with that information, I was able to. It was. It was. It was so. I was so grateful to him because you know doctors don't want to say well, this is going to happen and that's going to happen, especially with brain injury, because mm. brain, injury, brain does not, does not uh, regenerate like some organs do and some, you know, bones can and, and muscles can repair and all of that, but it can, it can improve. Um, and there's just no way to know what that's going to be. But the, with the extent of his damage, this doctor knew, and he, at least he was honest with me. So so yeah, I, I was able to make decisions based on that. I'm really glad that you were able to have that. That was a, that was an emotional part. And I, I recommend anyone who's listening to this to sit with it when you read it. Like don't, don't try to read it and do something else, you know, um, sit with it. Because mm-hmm. it, I found even myself asking my, what would I do in this situation? Like, what would mm-hmm. I have been needing right now and even um in my own caregiving situations it was so freeing to read about someone who was put in this extremely awkward position and i don't know this wasn't on our list we didn't talk about this question so if it's like way too personal just tell me to shut up and that you don't want to answer this but what what was that like because because the book is about the the repercussions right of you choosing against it could you talk a little bit about those moments where your identity, like you had to kind of find this new identity as a person who, of course, you're going to take care of your husband because that's what you do in this like understanding of because you're Jewish. And that I'm sure had an impact on why you felt that you had to take care of him and communal aspect of Judaism right? Are you willing to talk a little bit about what that kind of, do you know what I'm asking? I'm not asking it very well, but it's like, to me, it seems like you'd have to really wrestle with like, what is my identity as a Jewish woman if I say no to this? Oh, absolutely. That was a huge part of it. And that's really the crux of the book. Um, I talk about 
caregiving never really came very naturally to me. Like um, even with my kids, sometimes I resented it because even though I made the choice to have children and I understood intellectually what that meant. Um, and as a, any mother or parent will tell you, having the children is very different than imagining having the children. Uh, and especially when they have special needs or, um, things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and as a, as a performer since day one, practically, and that, that was always my identity. Um, that's a kind of a selfish, not in a bad way, but it's a, it's a self-centered identity. It's you, you have to be that way in order to like walk out on the stage and think people are going to, you know, want to sit there and listen to you and pay money to do it sometimes. <laughs> um, and, you know, rehearsals and, 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 and practicing and, and just keeping your instrument and um, healthy and, and doing all of that is a very, you have to be, have this kind of personality that's a little bit me, 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 yeah. right? Um, and so the, those, two, those two needs are very disparate, like what your family needs from you and what your career needs from you. Um, and so it was, I, I really pictured, I really imagined what my life would be like if I had, if I had accepted that role, mm. um, and, uh, that even the imagining of it just made my throat close up. Yeah. And so I had to listen to my body and to my, my, my heart and my soul that said, you can't do this and not just be a good mother to your children, but survive. Like I, I just didn't see myself being able to, 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 to do that. So, yeah. um, and, and it, and then that was the whole problem is that we, as women, especially we're just, it's just assumed that we're going to be the one to take care because that is kind of in our DNA in a way, you know, you know, the man had to go kill the beast and we had to cook it, cook it and take care of the kids and, you know, do everything at the same time. So, um, so yeah, it's it's really really challenging, um, particularly when that happens to you to you when your spouse is in that situation. Um, you know, most of us expect our parent to have to take care of our parents to some degree, right? We just kind of growing up, we just know that's going to be a role that we're going to mm -hmm. have to take on. Um, but when it happens so suddenly with a spouse um, or a child, it's it's a different situation. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing that and opening that up. Would now be a good time? Would you be willing to read a little bit for us? Yeah, um, this is a really short excerpt. Oh, but, um, that's okay. Yeah, I think mean, there's others I could read, but um, this um, this is uh, the first two weeks after David's uh, accident. Um, he was in a hospital in the Central Coast in the. A town called San Luis Obispo, because um, that's where he his plane crashed into a vineyard very very close by, and he was um, he was actually put into an induced coma because of he had very severe back injuries as well, and he was had a breathing tube, and so this was the day the moment when his breathing tube was being removed. Mm. <clears throat> We are celebratory as we gather around David's bed, waiting for the removal of the breathing tubes. The respiratory therapist is poised, eyes glued to oxygen levels on the monitor. The doctor makes the proper adjustments to the ventilator equipment, slowly extracts the tubes that have been David's lifeline for over a week. David gags and jerks, opens his eyes. He looks a little less like an alien now, I quip. Everyone laughs. Laughter, scarce in my current world, is still alive. Do you know your name? The doctor asks gently. David clears his throat several times. Then in his high, reedy, German-accented voice, he says, David. He clears his throat again. David. His voice is a surprise. Not that he is speaking. The doctors had said to expect that. Surprised that his voice sounds exactly the same. He sounds like my husband. Perhaps I've convinced myself that David wouldn't be David anymore, that everything, personality, appearance, behavior, even voice, would be altered completely. 
As a singer and voice specialist, I should have known better. His facial structure is indeed distorted, but his vocal folds aren't damaged. David is still in there somewhere. Welcome back. But I'm not sure who I'm welcoming. Hmm. Do you remember that vocal? moment? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I remember when he spoke and I was like, because for that whole period of time, I knew he'd be changed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it was all wait and see, wait and see, wait and see. We don't know what he's going to be like. We don't know how much cognitive functioning he'll re retain, regain. Um, and I, I just, I guess I just had this idea that his voice would sound different for some reason, but it didn't. Wow. Yeah. That must have been simultaneously um, reassuring and terrifying. Yep. It was. Just that cognitive dissonance of, I don't know who you are, and yet I know exactly who you are. Mm -hmm. And I'm That's so... Cool. Very well put. Yes. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm glad you wrote it down so everyone can read about it. <laughs> But I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Thank you. Yeah. I have another question. I, I can't decide. I... Sorry. Oh, no. We love the puppies. We love the puppies. Yes. Um... <laughs> Well, I'll, we'll go to this one. We'll go to we'll go to this one because I think this one is is I know the answer to this, but I want everyone listening to know the answer to this. And that is, was it healing to share your story? And what was the hardest part about writing the book? Um, you know, I actually wrote a whole blog post on on this topic. Um, we called... should link to it in the in the comments yeah, after. I should why writing is a form of therapy. And, and I start out, started out the piece by saying, you know, at the beginning of the process, when people found out I was writing the story, first thing they asked was, oh, you're probably doing it to, as a cathartic means of, of processing your story and, and getting some closure. And, and that actually isn't, at least it, consciously, it wasn't why at first. It mm. wasn't at all. It was, um, I just I literally, like I said before, I felt this compulsion. I said, oh my God, this is a story. Um, it has all the elements. Um, there's an eating disorder, there's cancer, there's um, stalking and being terrorized. There's this brain injury and the care, the caregiving, of course, that, that theme is the central theme, but- The sister-in-law. Um, the sister-in-law, there, there's all kinds of, there's, all, there's like, it takes a lot of boxes. That friend, um, there's, the friend there's of the sister-in-law, who is a whole other, y'all got to read this. Yeah. She's a, she's there's, there's like, some, yeah, she's there, there's a, there's a, well, the sister-in-law actually is, I, I have a lot of compassion for her. It's what she, she yeah. the closest she made, but, but there's a whole lot of medical drama and legal drama mm -hmm. too, you know, so it's like, whoa. This could be a movie. <laughs> I feel um, like, Rachel, though, I feel like when it becomes a movie, they're actually going to have to take stuff out of it in order oh, yeah. to. Yeah, there's so much. Well, it's like, can't believe. Series, maybe. <laughs> um, so uh, so you're, let's go back to the question about was it therapeutic? And um, it really, it, it, and now I see that it was. Absolutely. I would say probably about three quarters of the way through. Um, and honestly, the writing of it, of, of reliving some of those really awful things wasn't the hard part because, you know, I did a lot of processing in my, in my actual therapy mm. already, um, which was one of my saviors, yoga therapy and wine, um, <laughs> but whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And just having lots of crying sessions with friends that really helped a lot. Um, you know, it was it was trying to remember what happened and and chronicling it accurately in a way that was dramatically interesting and yet not, but but still according to the truth. So with with memoir, 
it's it's such a challenge because you you want to be you want to represent your story as well as possible and yet sometimes the some parts of the story aren't that exciting and you need to you need to kind of frame it in a way that it's going to be compelling and interesting and you, the, you want the reader to keep going. So I always wanted to be honest and true and yet also have a interesting narr narrative. Um, so again, for me, the hardest part was not so much putting my feelings down on paper because I'm just, I was raised in California in the 60s and 70s and kind of was expected always to be like super communicative and, and, right. and super yeah. If, if I didn't talk about my feelings all the time, my mom said, you know, you're holding something back. <laughs> so that wasn't the hard part. The hard part for me was the writing and, you know, the skill. Yeah. So let's get, can we, let's transition into kind of like the practicalities, because I, I know that we have many voice teachers who have self-published, gone through academic publishing routes, and then also uh, traditional publishing. So, so you decided to take the writing classes, you're doing the writing. You're putting the book together and it comes to the point where you're like, oh, this needs to actually like get distributed and printed and published and blah. So what was that? First of all, how did you publish? Because you went with like a, how did you publish? Yes. So I had to learn all about the publishing industry. Um, that was a very steep learning curve because I never, like when I pick up a book, I don't sit there and go, who is it published by? And, and how do they, yeah. it? I just, read the book, right. Um, and of course I'd heard of the big five random house and, you know, Bantam and, and, and Simon and Schuster. I, I think there's three now. Some of them have gotten mm. bought out. Um, and my, um, my editor, uh, the person who is quite a bit older. And so his, his career was mostly doing going through those traditional channels of if you want to be with a, a made a big five or one of the bigger publishing houses you first thing you need to do is query an agent so right. you need how to learn how to write a query letter because there's an art to that just like everything else and um, I actually took classes <laughs> in how to write a query letter and and uh, yeah all that stuff and then you send it out to as many agents as you can find that represent your genre. So if you're writing, you know, if you're writing mystery, you don't want to send it out to people who only write, who only represent, you know, um, thrillers or uh, that right. kind of thing. So um, there's even something called Query Tracker, where you, you <laughs> there's a whole software thing you can sign up for to see who you queried and what your answer was. Yeah. Um, and I also was interested in some hybrid publishers. So mm. this is a newish development, I'd say in the past 10 to 15 years. And what that is, is it's taking um, sort of the flexibility and the openness of self-publishing and it's marrying it with the more traditional model. So self-publishing, as you know, is, is open to anyone, but you really have to do so much on your own, like everything. You have to get the cover design and the interior design and you have to, and, and, and you're really restrict, you're limited by where it can be distributed. Hmm. So um, I had a, one of the women in my writing class, my, my writing group had um, told me about a hybrid publisher called She Writes Press. And She Writes obviously is only representing um, publishing women writers and I fell into that category, so that was no problem. Um, and I learned about it. And what I liked about this hybrid publisher where like Seco or Seco, yeah. <laughs> you make an investment. The author has an investment in their career by there is about at the time that I joined them, it was about an $8,000 fee and you mm. didn't pay that all up front. Um, and what you get for that though, is you get very traditional distribution. So oh, you get okay. group called, um, it's a distributor called Ingram and that if bookstores, oh, yes. that's the order through. Okay. So you don't get that necessarily if you're self-publishing, right? Right. right. Um, you also get a cover design as part of that and you get mm -hmm. to choose. You don't, you don't have to take what they give you. You can, you mm -hmm. can, there's options. That's you get a full cover. Thank you. So I got five different options and I chose this one. 
and it's cool because it was kind of my colors. And <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I also got the, believe it or not, the interior is a big, uh, there are people who just design interiors of books, right? Wow. Um, and um, I just got all of their ex expertise and all of, and, and they also have a secret Facebook group sound familiar, where we come on and we, we have meetings and we ask each other questions. And um, what I didn't get from them was a lot of the publicity. So I had to hire mm. a public separately. So that was another okay. experience. Um, but it was, again, it was a hybrid between completely self-publishing and going with a big publisher like yeah. you know, Penguin. Or, um, and the whole idea about an advance like, oh, they're going to they're going to want me to write this book and they're going to pay me to write it. That still happens, but much more seldom now, much right. less. Often. So even if so, say you're going to write a book, um, you know, about you, you're going to be Oprah's biographer. Well, you probably would get an advance for that. <laughs> but, um, you know, because we people know that's going to sell. Right. Um but that doesn't happen as much anymore. So, yeah. so, you know, writing I've learned is a lot like as being a singer, you know, you do it out of the love, you do it for the passion, you do it because you have a story and because you want to get your story out in the world. Um, and if you happen to make some money along the way, God bless you. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not equating that with teaching. Teaching is a different animal, but you know, it's, it's, we do it for the passion. Um, yeah. We do it because we have something to say. And, 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 um, and so I was kind of used to that. And I was prepared to invest in my story. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. That's how I published. And anyone out there that's interested in, in writing a memoir or, or a novel and they want to talk to me, hit me up. I love to answer these questions because yes. I've learned so much. And, um, and I did. I learned a lot. I love it. So you had just to give people kind of the overview, you had the writing classes, then you hired an editor. Right. So I started, I went to a retreat, a weekend retreat and, um, I you know, got a babysitter and all that. Yeah, yeah. And, and then that this retreat teacher offered these weekly classes. Um, some were feedback where if you've written something, some were called writing practice where she just give you a prompt Oh, nice. Cool. And it's just, yeah, you know, getting you writing. Um, but yeah, I, I really recommend classes. Um, mm -hmm. And then about two thirds of the way, I got kind of stuck and I just lost my confidence and I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I had huge imposter syndrome. I was like, who do I think I am <laughs> that I'm, that I can write a book? I mean, I'm, I'm a singer. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And, um, and I didn't write a word for about two years. I just stopped cold. You know, um, what? tell everybody how long this journey's been. 11 effing years, people. Oh my God. So that's from like idea to today, which launch was yesterday. So idea yeah, to 13, so, yeah. But when I finished my man, my, my, what we call in, in writing, there's a word for it. It's, it's very sweet. It's a shitty first draft. Yeah. So you just have to write, finish your shitty first draft and everyone knows it's going to be shitty. And I think the person who coined that phrase was Anne Lamott, yes. who is a very famous, you know, she wrote a whole bird book, by right? bird, bird by bird. Yeah. And, um, operating instructions, operating instructions. And plan B. <laughs> I could pull all the Anne Lamott off my shelf and show that, but we're it's, here for you, Rachel. It's so cool. Anyway. Um, but it took me a, because, you know, I was a single mom. I was dealing with all these legal issues. I was, um, I was a single mom. I mean, anybody who's a single mom or uh, imagine being what that's like, I just, like, I would drive my son to his breakdancing classes and I would grab the half an hour and, and I'd, you know, run over to Starbucks and, and, and type out a few pages, you know, and that's wow. kind of how I wrote it. Um, and then I went to a writing retreat in New York, um, upstate New York, and they had publishing industry professionals come in and speak to us. And they were like, it's really hard to publish. You know, it's really hard to get published these days. And I just was like major imposter syndrome. And so I just stopped. And then the book wouldn't leave me alone. It just kept eating away at my spirit. It just kept going, write me, write me, finish me. <laughs> Even if you don't publish, just finish it. Just get yourself a shitty first draft. 
And I said, I want to, but I'm kind of stuck. And that little boy said, hire someone to help you do it. Fancy that. Imagine that. Fancy asking for help. Hmm. Hmm. (laughs) And so I did. And, um, and you know, he didn't, I mean, he just was kind of like a cheerleader, kind of like Michelle is. (laughs) Well, Mary, Mary is giving you a big, I love this. Such a great testament to tenacity. Yep. Awesome. But keep going. So then you hired the editor. And I started again and, 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 you know, usually people submit an entire manuscript to an editor and then mm. they, but I kept, I kept giving him chapters. I kept giving him like pieces because I needed the, I needed the information. The bread- I needed yeah. The, yeah. And then one day when I had enough material, we, we, we sat with stacks of paper, scenes, different mm. chapters of things, and we just shuffled them around because the origin, the way I started the book is not at all how I originally thought I would start it. Like I took a scene kind of from the middle. So if you've read Wild by Cheryl Strayed, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. have you read that? Yep. She starts in the middle, middle. of her pike where her she's sitting on the edge of the mountain and her boot falls down the mountain and that's like a hook right that was like a hook to go oh oh I want to see how she got here right so I learned how to write the hook you know and all that stuff so um so then editor you finish it you finish it and that's when you looked then then you're like okay what are publishing options that's when you decided right. on she writes press which is in conjunction with ingram to do distribution and then oh but i still need marketing so you hired a publicist and that is the person who helped with the actual launch correct yes the publicist is she's gotten me on on this blog tour um, I've done a couple of interviews with NPR local stations. Don't get too excited. I'm not going to be on Terry Gross yet. Maybe that. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, got me placed in um, on some podcasts, you know, and all of that I, pr- I could have done on my own, but I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm not good at selling myself. So she, she was pitching me and, and she, she bought... 50 of these, the advanced reader copies. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And she just, and well, I bought them. I right, had to right, buy right. them. And, and then she sent them off to all these different reviewers and um, bloggers and radio hosts. And yeah. And so, um, and not only did I hire a publicist, but I also hired a social media manager because mm-hmm. I'm horrible as it was with tech. And um, and that person happens to be my website designer and a photographer. So it kind of goes in well, cause she has an eye for what will look good. Um, yeah. so yeah, I mean, so far all the money has gone that way, Yeah. <laughs> been this way. Um, mm-hmm. and I'm yet to see that, but, um, again, it, this, that isn't why right. I wrote this book. Yeah. But it'd be nice if I could recoup some of the costs, that would be really nice. Sure. I mean, I think that like the ultimate goal is to break even, right? Or the ultimate goal is like Mary's saying, um, to be interviewed by uh, Brene Brown. So because you are extremely vulnerable in this book. My favorite part of this book that I literally giggled at was when you are explaining a certain meal that you had with your um, mother and your siblings, right? Then and because I know you, so I know Rachel as this lovely, elegant, wonderful kind of um, very professional voice person who is charming and delightful and um, so um, silly and sweet. And it's a great little story about the Uh, other side of Rachel. (laughs) And, um, and I love that. So, but I'm not going to give it away. Cause you said, Michelle, don't give away too much of the book. When we were talking about you coming today, don't say too much. So this is a time where we need to tell people how to get a hold of this book. How do they buy this book? Well, there are all the traditional channels. Um, I'm the a word, which you all mm-hmm. know uh, that is, and I am, um, as it's a necessary, um, 
evil, I guess. Um, so of course it's available on, on Amazon and um, it's, it's, I, I recorded the audio book and it's also got a Kindle version. Oh, um, I love it. If you go through, yeah, your own independent bookstore. Um, I know it's more expensive, um, but do it you know, anyway. It's only like, it's a couple more bucks. Just, it's so important to mm -hmm. support them. Um, so um, my website is Rachel M. Author. Um, I can I can put the information again um, in the Facebook group or wherever you want me to put it, Michelle. Um, Rachel M. Author dot com, right? Correct. Okay, and there's I just a put it in the comments. Okay, wonderful. Um, and there's uh, there's an organization, uh, a company I really like called called bookshop.org and they their mission is to be like what I think Amazon was originally where they were just books right and mm -hmm. um, but um, this this company every independent bookstore gets a cut like there's it does yeah. support independent bookstores yeah so I, I put like that, that. I've got, went ahead and I put that link in there too so yeah. yeah I mean side note support your local independent stores it is one Starbucks more than Amazon. All right, friends, one Starbucks more, because we all know you drink the fancy drinks out there in <laughs> Faith Culture Kiss Studio for Voice and Acting Land, right? Yeah. So <laughs> that's it. Rachel, is there one last pivotal thing that you would share with us or one quote or one small expert excerpt with us that um, can just give us that one little carrot more? Hmm. One little tender bit. Um, yeah. Give me a second. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that what I want to do is the mess. There are two messages that I want people to be left with with my book. Um, I want people to know that they get to have their life and it's really okay to consider your options. If you are put in a situation where you are really uncomfortable or you are even panicked or makes you just terribly anxious, that it's okay to consider your options. And I know that I had a lot more options than a lot of people did do, um, but it's okay to not, to, to not take the beaten path and to, 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 to go in a different direction than what you think society or your family or your community expects of you. So that's one message. And the other one, is about resilience and thank you mary for talking about tenacity i think resilience and tenacity are two different things um but they're closely related um i never really understood how resilient i was until mm -hmm. i really looked at the story and um it's okay to just take it for five minutes at a time you know if you're in a really horrible time in your life where things feel like they're falling apart just remember you know Avenue Q, only for now, <laughs> that if you just keep going, you just keep walking, you'll you'll get to the other side. Um, and sometimes those steps are really heavy and really hard to take, and you feel like each step is 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 like a huge weight. Um, and it it does get better. So um, my my goal was that everyone in my family could have the best possible life that they could have given the most awful situation. And I wanted David, my husband, to have dignity and to, to be in a, in a living situation where he was respected and honored. And it, I just knew it couldn't be with, with me. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what happened. And I'm very grateful for that. He's living in, um, he's living in Israel with his sister and a wonderful caregiver. Um, and, you know, my kids visit him when they can, when there's not a pandemic in the world. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's the message that I want to give is, is just, you know, and also if there's, if you like, there's a book in you go for it, go for it.
I love it. Rachel, it has been, thank you. Thank you for sharing the exhausting day after your launch <laughs> with me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity for to read the advanced reader copy. And I have a message from the VIP group. They say, we are so proud of you. We got to be you. a part. Yeah, we miss you, but we love watching you thrive and grow. And it is amazing to, um, it's just such, such an amazing reminder of, you know, the values of, you know, even my business and your voice studio as well, that you're not just a voice teacher. Mm -hmm. Nobody is just anything. And that you are invited to be every single part of who you are. And you can be like Rachel and be brave, even when that identity tells you that you should be one thing, you can be brave and be who you are meant to be and who your body and your mind and like you said, your spirit is telling you to be. So everyone throw up some hearts, throw up some high fives for Rachel and you will, you buy her book again, her book, wait, let me get the little picture. And then you can, oops, that's the wrong one. There we go. But we like Mary, so we'll say hi to Mary again. So this is the book, Crash, How I Became a Reluctant Caregiver. And you can buy it at bookshop.org. You can visit Rachel's blog at rachelmauthor.com. And hopefully, in Rach if Rachel decides to write another book, then we will have her back at that time as well. <laughs> Everyone, have a fantastic weekend. And we will see you on the flip side. Bye.